All right, so without any further ado, I am going to introduce our um, guest for this evening, Greta Gard. Greta began practicing Vipassana meditation in 1995 at Common Ground Meditation Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. An early proponent of ecofeminism, Gard has written extensively to illuminate the linkages of race, gender, sexuality, species, and environmental justice, publishing six books and over 90 articles on ecofeminism, including several that articulate a mindful ecofeminism, which we'll be talking a little bit about tonight. Beyond Gary Snyder, Buddhism's Influence on U.S. Environmental Literature, Mindful New Materialisms, Mindful Ecocriticism, eco and Unstoried Air Breath Embodiment. Her presentation on humans, animals, and non-harming is available on the Dharma Voices for Animals website, and her most recent book is Critical Ecofeminisms, critical ecofeminism. As a professor of English at the University of Wisconsin, River Falls, Gard uses both mindfulness pedagogy and happiness practices in all of her writing classes. Mm -hmm. All right, so hi, Greta. Oh. <laughs> uh, so I'm really honored to have this opportunity to speak with you tonight. I've uh, been so inspired reading some of your work on the intersection of, of ecofeminism um, and Buddhist teachings. And I find it incredibly refreshing. I'm always seeking out um, sort of, you know, intersectional work in this way, work that really kind of marries a lot of these contemporary philosophical insights and, and, and contemporary and social issues with uh, uh, contemplative traditions and really making contemplative traditions alive for the current moment and you do that in such a beautiful way so I'm really looking forward to to chatting but before we get into kind of some of the substance of your work I'd love to just hear a little bit about your story and what has led you to the important work that you do well thanks um, I, I came to the Dharma as, as you noted in 1995 or 96 and I was on sabbatical and I had been um, organizing with the U.S. Greens. I'm one of the co-founders of the Green Party of Minnesota. Beautiful. And I, I was um, trying to do sort of, you know, what Rion Eisler was doing is a partnership ethics and trying to, you know, bring together men's groups working on eco-masculinity, trans and queer groups working on queering ecology, um, and resisting uh, at the time it was a strong movement uh, for globalization nafta GATT, the world trade organization in the 90s and i came to the dharma so angry mm. <laughs> i couldn't i couldn't stand being so angry anymore and um my sitting practice started exploring how i had been using anger as a fuel for my activism and really like fossil fuels, anger is a toxic fuel that burns you out. And it also alienates the people that you're working with. And as I looked deeper, I really saw that anger is not a primary emotion, it's a covering emotion. And I, I always use the analogy of dishes in the cupboard, probably it's a woman's analogy, I don't know, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but the anger is just the top dish, you know, and if you take that dish and throw it, there's a few other emotions underneath. And if you keep tossing the dishes, what you get down to is the last dish, which is a desire for connection. The, the grief of seeing so much severed connections. And underneath that, of course, is our interbeing. And um, my practice that year of sabbatical shifted my fuel from anger to compassion. And I started really exploring the Dharma. I think the, the message of the Dharma, like all great truths, is it's inside us. It's that little package inside of us that if we look deeply, it's right there. Um, and many of us come to that great room of truth, interbeing, uh, inter, inter, inter identity through through different hallways, I guess. And yeah. and for me, this is the one that was so clear to travel to come into seeing these connections. And I 
I'm really grateful. <laughs> Beautiful. So, you know, it's interesting that you're talking about anger because I feel like uh, uh, there's a lot of conversations right now talking about, um, you know, the role of what people refer to as righteous anger and, mm -hmm. and kind of, you know, and different individuals wanting to affirm that as a legitimate road. And in fact, there's a book I have here, Love and Rage, that uh, was just recently published by Lama Rod Owens. I'm going to be interviewing him next week. And, and I haven't gotten the way through the book, so I don't know the arguments yet, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. he's definitely trying to preserve this role for anger. So what, what would you, what do you think is the difference between an anger that um, you know, someone like Rod would be trying to kind of leverage and support versus something that, you know, you see as really a kind of strangling emotion that's covering up something else? Yeah, that's a great question. It shows a lot of perception, uh, clearly. <laughs> um, so love and rage has been, you know, the banner of anarchism for mm. ever. Um, and uh, I think about um, my rage as being the covering card of grief at seeing the destruction of environments, of animals, of children, of communities of color where pollutants are dumped, of um, injustice, that that is a rage that comes from wanting to protect. But rage is a, a, a slippery fuel because it can very quickly morph into a creation of self. That is the, the self that is righteous. Mm. Um, so I know a lot of animal activists, you know, look at the uh, cows, for example, who um, in a few decades ago, grieve and grieve when their calves are taken from them so that the cow's milk can be given to humans. The cows fight, they resist, they chase, um, and the calves and the cows call to each other. So now industrial dairy breeders are breeding cows so that they, the cows that are indifferent are being bred more so that the mothers won't care. Mm. So this is really severing the bond of connection that is our lifeline. It's our survival lifeline. And that's what a mechanistic alienated culture is doing is severing our connections. So yes, we are grief stricken and perhaps because I haven't read Lama Rod's book either <laughs> on the rage. Um, but, um, you know, the George Floyd uh, incident happened in my neighborhood. He was mm -hmm. murdered in my neighborhood. Oh my God. And I w was there with people on the first night of the protests when we walked from that site at 38th and Chicago uh, across town to the third precinct. And, uh, yelled at the police um, and things changed from the grief that was raging to a kind of selfhood of being the righteous, the defiant, the destroyer. And I know people pulled out and came back and you know it's so entangled that it's it's hard to work with yeah well i want to talk a little bit more about that and there's so much you know with regards to that and also covid um uh, you know i enjoyed reading your your article on covid and we'll talk a little bit about that later um but in terms of you know I wanted to ask a kind of follow-up question to your evolution as an activist and, and your relationship with the Dharma, because as you were saying before, it, activism for you uh, pre-existed your encounter with the Dharma and, you know, your, your, um, your involvement in these issues. So I'm curious, you know, besides kind of a, a new um, approach or, or resources to kind of understand and, and resolve the anger that was that was kind of stifling you. What are some of the other kind of resources that that um, enriched your own activism that you found in the Dharma? Uh, 
often in uh, public speaking, uh, I'm gender socialized to not want to do it perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, one, one switch that I, I made pretty quickly was um, noticing that uh, how a self was coming to the podium and dropping it and shifting my gaze to those that I was speaking about mm. and those that I cared about. And then it was very easy to speak. Mm. Uh, then there was no attachment to whether people disagreed or agreed because it was important to speak about injustice and about those whose voices weren't being heard. Um, that's certainly one way. Um, you know what? A daily sitting practice will go a long way for you. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. 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 It's absolutely incredible. The, the cumulative effects of, you know, daily sitting. And that's certainly something that at Embodied Philosophy, we're always trying to proselytize the seated practice for mm -hmm. sure. Um, so, uh, one of your articles I read um, was about mindful new materialisms. And, you know, as the title suggests, you talk about a new materialism. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this. You know, what is this new materialism or new materialisms that, that, you're, um, that you're speaking about? And how does it contrast with the quote unquote old materialisms? Uh, new, new materialisms draws on uh, physics of Karen Barad. It, it draws on some continental philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, it has some political threads in it. And um, the, the, the argument is that um, both the, the speaking about matter and the material quality of matter co-arise mm -hmm. and that our identities are co-created, that situations co-arise. And the reason that I wrote that article is because um, it's dependent origination. Yeah. Uh, and it was charming to see, this is what I mean about the many doorways into the great room, you know, yeah. that, that people were coming at it in a very cerebral kind of way, talking about matter and physics and semiotics and so forth. And the Dharma has addressed this thousands of years ago, you know? So um, I just wanted to link that uh, connection. So the old materialism then, you know, so you're talking about the, the qualities of matter and sort of the, the identities, the narratives are, are sort of intersecting right whereas the old an old kind of materialist paradigm would suggest that like on the one hand you have material processes and then and then you have this you know the human consciousness which is in some sense not real or is in some sense not related to the kind of independent processes of of materialism is that kind of the idea well jane bennett's work on vibrant matter um, really shifts the old materialism from a, a sort of mechanistic view of, right. of the earth as mindless um, to uh, recognizing the agency in everything, the intelligence in, in every part of matter. And again, indigenous cultures have been saying this. Right. Well, Westerners have to you know, get advanced degrees and do the research and then come up with the same point. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, so in this uh, article, you, you, and you already mentioned dependent origination. So I want to talk about these three, these fundamental Buddhist concepts that you, that you explore in the article <clears throat> and how they intersect with feminist teachings. And one of them is, is the teachings on impermanence or anicca, the, in, the teaching on no self or anatta, and then the teaching on dependent origination or paticca samuppada. So um, can you take a moment and just kind of unpack these three concepts and, and, and touch on them in, in relationship to kind of the, the, the ecological worldview that, that you support? Um, well, they're all interconnected. Right. Um, so so de dependent arising, um, reminds us that everything is impermanent, 
that this world is in continuous flux, that this table and chair that I'm sitting at and on um, seems stable, but that's because my view of time is incorrect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this table and chair have come into being and they will cease to be. And I happen to catch them at the moment that I can sit on them, yeah. uh, which is lucky for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so that, that's how de dependent origination uh, and, and impermanence work together. The idea of no self goes along with the table and the chair. That is the idea of a permanent continuous self is also um, an illusion because uh, we have come into being and we see sort of an outline of this self, but even that outline is illusory because this self is um, co-existing and interacting with air, with food, with substances that I are invisible. This self is not unitary. I mean, some of us get kind of creeped out by how many microorganisms are in here having their own party. Mm -hmm. And they're not really interested in like what Greta thinks, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the idea that we're single and not multiple, that we're separate and not interdependent um, are, are very Euro Western kinds of ideas. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. So one of the things that you, uh, that I really appreciate that you address in the article is that um, sometimes the idea of no self can be seen in as in conflict, at least from a certain perspective, with those practices of affirming the self that are central to the, you know, the kinds of forms of social recognition that are seen as necessary in so many social justice movements. Mm -hmm. So how do we reconcile the teachings of no self with these practices of affirming the self that seems so central to social justice? Mm -hmm. Well, these are, these are locations and relationships. So the identity politics, these identities come into being through relationships that are hierarchical, relationships that are alienated, instrumentalizing, um, exploitative. Um, so uh, it's both the relationship that constructs the two identities of the, the privileged and the marginalized, the, the, the owning class and the owned. Um, it, it's both. Um, the uses of identity politics are in highlighting these locations that then yeah. illuminate relationships. The downfalls are um, hardening around, constricting around a particular identity that then one has to defend. Mm. Yeah, so you, you, one of the quotes that you, um, you write in this article, feminists have noted the gender bias in the Jat Jataka tales, legends about Buddha's earlier incarnations prior to enlightenment, particularly the story about the Buddha sacrificing himself to be eaten by a hungry tiger so that she and her cubs might live. Such laudatory narratives of heroic non-attachment praise a man for self-sacrifice, but remain silent about the countless daily and lifelong forms of self-sacrifice required of many women through traditional gender roles. Developing spiritual teachings that address how women can move from that relational self-identity to an appropriate view of anatta, coexistent with a functional selfhood, one that does not cling to identity yet recognizes the usefulness of identity in performing daily tasks has been a project for women dar Dharma teachers. Mm -hmm. So this quote for me, if I'm understanding it correctly, it suggests that Dharma teachings cannot be read as kind of in a vacuum or as if every social, social subject is operating from the same locus of identity, right? So if you know differentiated subjects and the varying social and material conditions in which they're embedded, um, does this mean that the Dharma entails differently for different people? Is that something that you would agree with? The, the section you quoted uh, suggests that the Dharma requires social justice. Mm. That to practice the Dharma means to work for social justice because these structures hold people in place. 
they push men to be a certain way, white men to be a certain way. I really think about the Boogaloo boys, you know, and the, the proud boys, the, the, the white supremacists who are, you know, returning to Minneapolis now and gunning their cars through our neighborhoods and setting off fireworks at two in the morning, three, four in the morning. I mean, keeping up a level of harassment that's phenomenal. They're suffering. Mm. They're suffering. There's an identity. There's an anger there that is burning. Um, and they're, they're wanting to cause suffering, you know? So this is a structural thing. How can, how can we sit in a Dharma hall on a cushion while this is happening around us? How can we, you know, go for individual enlightenment, so to speak, without working for the community if we understand no self and inner being? Um, I mean, to, to draw from a different framework, you know, after an addict goes through recovery, they, they try not to send that person back into their dysfunctional family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they try to put that person in a sober house in a different community so that different kinds of uh, behaviors and beliefs can be supported and promoted. And so we're back to the, the importance of Sangha, which everyone says is 99% of the path. We have this beautiful teaching and we need community. We need community in order to practice it. Yeah. So, you know, I think that there, you know, what you're, so you're when you were referring to like sitting on the cushion, I feel like this is a really common um, situation in spiritual communities and one that is actually being problematized right now in a variety of really uh, progressive and, and important ways. And um, do you have any, you know, additional thoughts on this sort of this habit and, and how we got to this idea that, you know, spiritual practice is some sort of self-involved navel gazing pursuit that has no, you know, impact on the world. And then also, you know, on the other side of it, there's, I think there's also this um, uh, tendency sometimes in, in some activist circles to think that actually there is no role for meditation. I don't have time for meditation. Meditation is not as important as, you know, going out into the streets and making an impact. Um, so, you know, how, maybe just some ideas on this balance between, um, you know, our contemplative practice and our practice in the world and how to kind of look at that relationship. Uh. I, th I thought a few things when you were talking and now I've, I've only got the last one. <laughs> That's okay, we'll get there together. <laughs> um, the last one uh, was simply uh, reminded me of being in New York City for the People's Climate March mm. and coming around Central Park in the corner. Uh, my daughter and I had decided to be um, working with bread and puppets from Vermont. Mm. And so we were Arctic caribou that kept getting oil spilled on and died and then got up and performed it again and again with our puppetry and which is poignant now because of the present oil spill in the arctic and the hundred degree temperatures up there um as we came around the corner of central park the hill there before the street going into uh manhattan was covered with yogis meditating mm. they were holding that presence and so that we could march yeah. more mindfully, more aware of that, you know? So sometimes, you know, you don't have to do it all yourself. <laughs> yeah. you, you might be the one who's simply sitting. Sometimes you might be the one marching, you know? Um, the idea that uh, the Dharma is some life of renunciation, of course, comes from uh, it being a, a male practice traditionally, yeah. um, because women didn't have that choice. Women yeah. had to find ways to integrate the Dharma with mothering, with household chores, with doing the work of daily life. And so did many householders too, yeah. have to figure that out. And so the prestige idea of it being the lone monk going off to meditate, um, we're, we still have that, of course, in the West, we still have that. But um, I think a lot of communities are challenging that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So 
Um, I want to kind of segue into um, some questions related to another article that I read of yours, um, beautiful article on affects and narratives. And um, I think the title was Mindful Ecofeminism and uh, the subtitle was on affects and narratives. And you talk about, you begin that, that article with reflecting on the controversy surrounding an article called The Uninhabitable Earth. Mm. Um, and this article was critiqued um, by various people because from cer certain people's perspectives, it was paralyzing in that it was so fear mongering that and fatalistic that like, what can we do? And, and this does seem to be, you know, a, a common sort of narrative now, right? Is this narrative of like, there is no hope. We've, we've gone past the threshold. There's no, you know, looking back, we're all screwed. Like, you know, what can be done? And, and it does sort of, um, maybe in some people's experience lead to this feeling of, well, what can little old me do? You know, it's this waterfall of horror. <laughs> and, and so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that and the way that we narrativize the current, um, you know, uh, situation and, you know, not wanting to like for put our heads in the sand and be like, la, 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 no, there's still hope, but all, you know, needing to actually be confronting the the horror of you know and the and the problems as they are but not to the point where we actually are disempowering ourselves what do you what do you think about that sort of situation <laughs> yeah well these are these are great questions and and college students who you know take environmental justice or climate justice classes come to this point where they think what can I do? What can I contribute? Or it's also overwhelming. So these are really two questions. Okay. Yeah. So the, the idea of, you know, what can I do? I want to make a difference. Um, so one of the keys of effective activism is having a view for the long haul. Mm. You will win battles and then you will lose the same battle within a decade and have to fight it again and win it again. And so in a way, being an activist, if you bring a Dharma perspective to it, is a great teaching because you notice your attachment to outcome. You notice your attachment to self. I won that battle. I was instrumental in winning that battle. And oh, now Murphy Oil is still polluting Lake Superior and we have to go back and fight it again. Okay. Line three in Northern Minnesota that goes through indigenous ricing lakes, you know, mm -hmm. um, we've, we've fought it, fought it, lost ground, moved forward. It's still going. Keystone, pipeline, still going. Um, so there's that attachment to outcome. And there's um, the problem of grandiosity that, you know, unfortunately, we've been listening to a lot of narratives about um, male saviors. Mm. <laughs> Buddha, Aren't we over that yet? <laughs> Jesus, Mohammed, you know, the, the, the heavy hitters, right? Yeah. And it's like, it's that all or nothing. Well, I mean, if you're not Jesus, what are you doing? You may right. as well give up, you know? And yeah. so the, the, the good news is you're not Jesus, okay? And the Thank good God. news is, <laughs> the good news is you still have work to do. There is still something you can contribute. So it's releasing that grand epic narrative, mm. okay? Like the monk that goes out is, you know, the grand narratives are not serving us they're paralyzing the majority and they're making us wait for a savior you know and and as feminists and uh, have said you know we are the ones we have been waiting for we are the ones and it's plural mm -hmm. the idea that anything that's going to happen is going to be movement it's not going to be individual so that's the first piece the second piece is, as you said, about those articles that said, oh, here's the situation about the earth. And the debate about, well, don't tell people that because it's really bad and then people will be paralyzed. There is across the disciplines now a conversation ongoing about affects and narratives. That is, what kind of affect can we activate or appeal to in people that will catalyze their own agency that will reach in and reconnect them with their own agency and purpose and will have them feel yes what i have to contribute in this big pot is about a dime and i'm going to give it 
Mm. I'm going to give it because everybody needs to give that dime, whatever it is they have. So what affect is it going to be? And um, that, you know, the debate has even uh, circled around um, the, the uh, energy documentary that um, Roger and me, what, what's the guy's name? He paired up with another um, filmmaker and they went out and did this documentary, which they gave, made live on YouTube. And it was about the fact that renewable energy isn't going to save us. Mm. Um, Oh, his name's on the tip of my tongue. The Roger. Yeah, maybe maybe somebody from the audience will know. Let us put it in the chat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so so the the you know environmental activists have said renewable energy alone will certainly not save us, but fossil fuels are definitely going to destroy us. So yes. there is no future that doesn't include renewable energy, and it's only a piece of the puzzle. Michael Moore. Michael thank Moore. You. <laughs> Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> this is why it's great to have a, a group great. of people with us. Yeah, it's community. <laughs> that's right. So um, th that that's uh, a disservice then to um, discourage the people who are doing the work. Mm. Um, we want to think about both the affects and the information. And this is, again, a problem of Euro-Western culture is that we think we can just give the information that is appeal to the brain. Yeah. and not appeal to the affects. The affects are housed in our bodies. Our bodies are the stringed musical instrument that plays that note, that powers and activates the information, and both have to work together. Yeah. And so, you know, you, the, your embodied philosophy, I mean, this is part of the, the move behind decolonizing uh, the takeover of the Dharma in the West. Yeah, I'm really glad you say that because I, you know, that's, I think, such an important point, this idea that, you know, I, I think that there's this, you know, cultural assumption that, like, if I just have the information that that will be enough to sort of trigger a certain kind of motivation or, or affirmation in my life such that I can be involved. And it seems like with affect, what you're talking, this is where contemplative practice comes in, right? Because contemplative practice is, you know, amongst other things, uh, directly involved in cultivating alternative affects and cultivating affects that, uh, that might, um, you know, um, motivate us in ways that we wouldn't otherwise be motivated. Do you, are there other kind of, what are some of the sort of tools or, or techniques, you know, besides meditation that could help us cultivate these, aff the affects that, that, uh, that um, that you think are important, and then maybe what are those specific affects? Are there are there names uh, that we could <laughs> that we could use that would uh, would actually um, sort of signify what these affects are? Well, um, I, I'm not sure if it was in the the materials I sent to you, or it was in the Bifrost piece mm. um, where I talk about um, teaching uh, sustainable happiness in one of my yeah. writing courses, and what what that uh, approach does is it bridges the paramitas, the heavenly abodes, with um, positive psychology um, in looking at what is our definition of happiness as a culture. When we're talking about narratives, you know, the cultural narrative of the United States has been a narrative of colonialism, conquest, consumerism, theft, appropriation, and the lone hero. And so why should we be surprised that people in the US think, if I can't stop this pipeline, then I have nothing to contribute, me personally, you know? There's so many ways that we're affected by these narratives. So um, in the sustainable happiness uh, thread in my writing classes, um, we, we look at climate change readings to write about them. We look at species extinction. Uh, we looked at migrations and we look at uh, the rigged economy and, and really ask the question, what view of happiness has led us to create the conditions of climate change, mm. climate racism? Yeah. And what kind of happiness will we need to undo and to recreate and to heal. 
this earth, one another, and our culture? And these are powerful questions. And surprisingly enough, Wisconsin students can answer them. They can ask them and they can address them. Wow. Um, so, you know, we, we all have that ability. Yeah. <laughs> it's just no one has asked the question. I think we, we need to give people the opportunity to look at the question. So we, I talk about um, the, the first is a practice of gratitude. Um, you know that all of our breaths in this life come in pairs, except the first and the last. That's, those are the mm. frame pair. And our first breath is a breath of gratitude we take in. Thank you. And our last breath is a breath of generosity. We give back deeply everything from our whole life. And in between all of those is reciprocity. <laughs> and so the first practice of happiness is generosity. And I have students um, first be, I'm sorry, gra gratitude that they count their blessings. They say what makes them happy. And we come up with a really good class list like paper clips, candles, coffee, my yes. pillow. Yeah. <laughs> like it doesn't have to be being the CEO. Like, and so it reminds people, you know what? You're happy right now. There are elements in your life that you're happy right now, but are you attending to them? Are you mindful of them? Can we expand them by savoring them? So then we do savoring practices. Mm. Then we do acts of kindness that, that are free, that are pay it forward. Like let someone ahead of you in traffic. It's amazing. They wave, you wave, then they do something nice. It ripples and then you feel good about it. Um, when I ask students to remember what was your act of kindness, people come up with things they did three years ago. And it's easy to point out, you are still savoring that act. And it made you no money. So look to where your happiness is actually arising. I mean, a lot of our culture has trained us like puppies, you know, look over here, look over here. <laughs> Don't look over here where your actual happiness is arising with each breath, mm. where your mm. gratitude arises with each meal, you know, thank you. Think about, you know, the dependent origination that created that meal, the sun, the rain, the soil, the insects, the plants, the farmers, mm. the truckers, you know, mm. I mean, so here we are. So, so I'm reminding people of all of these small happiness practices, yeah. And then asking, how could our economy align with the things that make us happy and make the earth happy? Because you know what? If the earth isn't happy, you're not going to be happy either. That's true. <laughs> yeah. And communities, you know, if, if women are complaining about the way they're marginalized and the pay is bad, the other people aren't going to be very happy either. You know, and we're seeing here, if, if our police systems have institutional racism that keeps annihilating black lives it's escalated to a point where we're not happy no no one is happy except the very small minority that somehow gets off on this you know and maybe they have a piece of them too that isn't happy yeah absolutely <laughs> well i want to ask a question i want to come back to the breath um uh, thoughts on the breath because um uh, there's some just interesting uh, kind of symbolic things about both the COVID and also George Floyd um, with I Can't Breathe. And I want to talk about that in a minute. But one of the things I wanted to um, just kind of highlight in this conversation about happiness that I think is really interesting in your work is you talk about how um, this and this is a quote from <clears throat> Mindful Ecofeminism. Our narratives seem disinterested in happiness as an actual story world. Instead, happiness is seen as facile, simplistic, mundane, boring. It's the end of the story, not the beginning. And you know, and you talk about how in you know the American um, the Declaration of Independence, it's all about the pursuit of happiness. So happiness is always deferred 
right? So our whole kind of cultural ecosystem is built around the idea of happiness at the end of the line. And so we don't actually have, we can't live within a story in which happiness is already here. So can you talk a little bit about um, what it means to say that, or what it could look like even, and maybe we're talking about it because you're describing it already, but happiness as a story world. And I just thought, I thought this idea of a story world was really interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, I do credit Erin James for that and her book yeah. on the story world. Um, the, the, uh, the pursuit of happiness is deeply tied to a certain economic production because uh, when people are content, what do they do? They subsist. They don't shop as much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, they're, they're not, they don't really need another new car every five years if the car they have is working. Um, th th there's, there's a way that it's, it's been tied in the United States and probably in other cultures too, although I don't want to speak about other cultures because I inhabit, I'm in this one, you know, uh, but, but we look at the way that the economy rewards behaviors that make very few happy and not for very long. And, and they steal happiness from the majority. They steal happiness from rivers, from indigenous people, from air, from trees, uh, from city dwellers, and they convert it into material wealth. I think about this book that I always bring into my classes. It's by Shel Silverstein and it's called The Giving Tree. And many people of my generation were raised on that book at one time or another. And um, the giving tree is gendered. The tree is a female. It's a metaphor. And the little boy, who is, of course, the stand-in, the little white boy for all of humanity, takes and takes and takes until finally the tree has given everything and is only a stump. And the little boy comes back and sits on the stump and it says, the tree is happy. It's really hard to be happy if you're a stump, okay? So there's a little perversion of narrative there, I think. Um, but, but happiness is a relationship. It has to be flow. It has to be reciprocity. We have to receive. It's our, it comes back to our breath again. We have to receive the air. We have to give it back. That's what life on this material planet requires of us. Yeah. Okay, so my fo my follow up question to that then is, you know as we're talking about happiness is is a relationship. Is it possible? And I know a lot of people have been asking this question, like how can I be happy when all of this is you know when everything is shit? <laughs> you know, like is it possible to be like according to the idea of happiness that you're unpacking here? Is it possible to be in a story world of happiness while? there is still so much injustice and ecological devastation happening? Well, you're asking, what is it like to be a bodhisattva? Yeah. I mean, the bodhisattva role um, that anyone can step into and say, I, I want to do this, is coming from a place of tremendous compassion and groundedness in, in his or her, because the gender changes, you know, if you look at the images, yeah. his, her, or their happiness and moves toward a suffering world to offer compassion, to offer empathy, to do what is possible to do, not just to care and then walk away, but to, to lend energy and support. Um, but it, the, the, coming from any other place is less effective. So coming from a place, I mean, we've all interacted with people who are calm when we're really agitated. And at some point, instead of meeting other people who are agitated, we encounter someone who's really calm yeah. and it's woof. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it doesn't mean we stop 
the work that needs to be done, it means we do it from a place that doesn't have the agitation. So we're more skillful. Yeah. So now a very pragmatic question. What are a few steps one could take to get to that still uh, place where one can sort of be engaged in the world, but have this kind of equanimity that, that you seem to be referring to here? I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm just asking that because I know there's always questions like, what can I do right now? Like, what are, what, how can I get there? You know, because there's so many of us right now um, that are just feeling so incredibly agitated, so incredibly frustrated, and, and really horrified, quite frankly, by, by many of the things that, you know, we're seeing our culture and the people in it capable of. So, you know, what are some kind of very pragmatic steps that you'd offer um, the listeners? Uh, first, I'd say find your teachers. Mm. There's more than one. So if you're doing a sitting practice and you're frustrated with it and it's not working, there's probably two things missing. One is a teacher. So maybe your teacher isn't in your town. Maybe you live in a small town. So go on Dharma Seed and listen to some guided meditations. Listen to some talks. See what teachers resonate with you and let them guide you. Um, right now, I'm listening to Tara Brock. Love her. Yeah. Really powerful feminist vision, feminist, anti-racist, anti-speciesist, without all the theory, totally with the compassion. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that that is, I'm listening to her. Yeah, yeah, she's <laughs> great. Teacher. Lion's Roar. A lot of teachers are coming forward in Lion's Roar and Buddha Dharma to address coronavirus, to address uh, systemic racism, and they're offering. So get, get out there, read it, study it, see if it, if it create a, a, a sitting group if you don't have one, if you, and practice with people and, and discuss the Dharma. Um, the, the, this is not a magic bullet. It's a process. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. Well, I have another question, but I want to invite everyone who's with us to uh, please, uh, if you haven't yet um, put some questions in, please do so. I'm going to transition now in a cup in a minute or two into our Q and A. And so I would love to have a few questions in there ready to go to ask Greta. So um, please, yes, t let's take this opportunity since we have Greta here with us to uh, to ask any questions that you have about anything related to um, anything that we've discussed or something else, perhaps. <laughs> um, so I wanted to come back to um, this article that you wrote on 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 COVID coronavirus, and um, it was very interesting. It's a really interesting article, and you you kind of talk about. Um, uh, you know, you suggest sort of coronavirus being kind of messenger in a certain way. Um, and so, uh, but as I was reading it, one of the things that kind of occurred to me is that, you know, in, 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 in speaking about the breath and of course so much about, you know, Vipassana meditation, so much about just contemplative practice um, hinges on a kind of an encounter and, a, and cultivating a relationship with the breath. And then we have these two, the, the kind of, symbols of the moment that we're in, in a really kind of strange way, boil down to the breath, right? Coronavirus affects the lungs. We can't, you know, those who are struck by it can't breathe. And then the, you know, the famous um, uh, last words of George Floyd was, I can't breathe. And so I'm just wondering if, if there's any kind of thoughts, you know, about this moment that we're in and how the wisdom of the breath it's almost like it's it's being screamed for the need for the wisdom of the breath so i just wanted to kind of you know ask you about um your thoughts related to to all of this well the the breath carries the message of our interbeing mm. of no self and um it it also these situations also raise awareness of the idea of um, human identity as white, as privileged, and as separate. And so we're really, you know, standing on the limb of the tree that, and we're sawing off the limb, you know, the old, the old image. 
That is, um, the coronavirus came about through a constellation of practices, one of which is um, increased uh, urbanization that pushes up against wildlife habitat so that there's more uh, interactions between humans and wildlife and humans uh, who have traditional practices of, of eating wildlife, okay? So that's, that's a concern. Then the way that, that in the first world, in the US, that we treat other species, a lot of the zoonotic diseases that we've seen, SARS, uh, BSE, BGH, uh, the bovine spongiform encephalopathy, um, these, um, the avian bird flu, uh, these all come from industrial agriculture practices. Mm -hmm. And the idea that we can, as humans, we can treat others this way in confined, packed, crowded, separated from families, mutilated, no purpose other than to be bodies. So this is mapping this huge body-mind dualism on to food that we can treat them that way with no consequences. So this is a wrong view. Yeah. <laughs> wrong view of dependent origination, wrong view of uh, anatta, of our interbeing. Um, and the earth, which indigenous cultures and other cultures tell us is our great teacher, is saying, you have to listen. You have to listen. The air is not empty. Mm. The earth is not empty of intelligence. And this message is a message that is intelligent. We breathe it and it informs us this is what it feels like in the body. I hope we hear that message. Yeah. Wow. Oh, such beautiful words. Um, so Greta, let's, let's take some questions here. Um, there's just a few, but I, uh, again, I'd like to invite everyone to please ask questions. If you, uh, uh, there are no bad questions, of course. Uh, uh, but uh, so from Bonnie, this is actually just a question regarding the citation for your COVID article. Bonnie, we will add that. I'll add that to, um, actually, um, uh, Rebecca, if you can find that, you might not be able to get it right now. Uh, we'll make sure to send that in a follow-up email, Bonnie. Uh, it's not e immediately at hand, um, but it's, well, maybe, yeah, Greta, go ahead. Um, it's on the Bifrost Online special issue about the coronavirus, um, which came about because I started writing an open letter to the Environmental Humanities, which is my academic discipline, saying, this is a message we're receiving and how are we going to change our lives mm. in response to this? What are we going to do to take this message seriously? And I circulated it and different people signed on and they added to the open letter and through networking, because I didn't want it to be just me, just like I said, you know, it's got to be a community. Mm -hmm. I connected with the person who uh, is the editor of Bifrost Online, Stephen Hartman in Sweden. And he was like, this is it we need to run with it and we invited people to do their own articles and so my essay is one of those on the coronavirus as messenger but there's many other great essays too beautiful yeah thank you for that and rebecca you're a superstar um thank you rebecca just put in the link but i think you just sent it to all panelists rebecca so will you just make sure that it's sent to all panelists and attendees um, and uh, yes, it's bifrostonline.org forward slash Greta dash guard. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and there it is. So Courtney's asking um, why you gravitated toward Vipassana in particular. Hmm. Well, as a girl growing up in Los Angeles, my mother took me to the Naishiren Shoshu Society and mostly we chanted. And that was my takeaway at that time as a girl going mm. to downtown Los Angeles. So in Minnesota, when I was on this break, I was living collectively, now this is no surprise, is it? So 
I was living collectively and one of my housemates said, we got into a conversation. And I said, oh yeah, you know, I used to practice Hinduism, a form of Hinduism as a teenager. And uh, I wanted to be a renunciant. But when I came out, uh, the monks told me that it would be like putting a fox in the chicken coop if I were to go into being a renunciant with other women, mm. being attracted to women. So it was like believing that people have no self-control or, you know, I don't know. So that was a really homophobic comment. Yeah. yeah. And I um, gave, up, gave up that practice and became an intellectual for about 15 years, you know, the years of college and such. And so it, at my sabbatical then, this, the housemaid and I got in a conversation and she said, you know, you, you're a Buddhist. And I said, I never thought so. And she said, come with me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was like, oh, I'm a Buddhist. <laughs> and Love it was Vipassana. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. So Courtney again asks, can you share your thoughts about veganism and feminism? female cows being impregnated in order to exploit them for milk, etc. cetera. Sure. Um, well, she probably knows there's a, there's a whole uh, Facebook group, Mothers Against Dairy. And their, their motto is, not your mother, not your milk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cute. I mean, you know, it, why get angry when you could be charming, you know? Yeah. So it's like, it helps you to think like, oh, that's not my mother. Okay, yeah. um, so it, it's um, the, the simple telos there is that uh, milk is for babies um, and mothers want to have a decision about where their milk goes and uh, mothers who choose to nurse, you know, human mothers choose to nurse their own babies. Um, so we have a huge history in the U.S. of enslaving African women to steal their milk for white slave owners' children while that mother's children go without the milk that would, have, would make them healthy. The black children are deprived of their mother's milk so that she can wet nurse a white child. Um, there's no exact comparison between women of color and women of a different species or females of a different species. So what we're looking at is structures, structural theft, structural um, erasure of the, the being's choice, drive, purpose, decisions. Um, the, the same as, as this uh, writer probably knows, um, goes for eggs that, you know, we, we talk about spreading your wings and taking someone under your wings, but that metaphor goes back to a particular mother. She's a bird. And it's what she does with her chicks is hold them close. Mm. So um, th these are feminist issues because it's an exploitation of the female. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Elise is making a, a comment or a question. Uh, what you said about listening makes me wonder about the Buddha statues and how they usually have big ears. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for that. <laughs> I know there might be something there. Yeah. So um, I do, we don't have any more questions. And if you do have a question, please feel free to throw it in, of course. Um, but I do have one more question, actually, you mentioning um, queerness. And one of the things I, I, you know, just from reading your work, I, I, I really want to focus for our upcom an upcoming journal issue on the topic of queer dharma um, and some of the really interesting work that's being done there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you're going to have to contribute. <laughs> um, so I'm just, you know, I want to talk about that for a second before we end our interview. And, and, and you know, how does queer theory um, uh, align with the, some of the things we've been talking about? What does it mean, you know, you mentioned queering emptiness, you know, which is, uh, as many people know, a concept shunyata in, in Buddhism and also in Hinduism. Um, and also you mentioned queering interbeing, which of course, you know, they're the same thing essentially. So what, is, what does this mean to queer emptiness or queer interbeing? I think it just shakes loose uh, from those concepts, things that are already there. But as Westerners, we hear those and we think that interbeing is sort of like 
packaged, even though, even though we're seeing it as uh, something connected. I went to the Mind and Life Summer Research Institute last summer and had the wonderful opportunity to study with a lot of great you know, mindfulness scholars, researchers, practitioners, psychologists, what have you. And um, one of them uh, works with the concept of going from me to what he calls me-we, me-we. That is uh, making that shift to a connected. Yeah. And I've really been sitting with that as being problematic for the ways that it only encircles the we. What about them? (laughs) Yeah. So uh, queering interbeing raises that question and says, yes, the connections that you're making with your family or people who are just like you or all the good progressives in Minnesota, that's cool. But how can you include the Boogaloo boys? Where, where does that come in? How do you, right, right. Yeah. That's the hard part, right? But how do you, and I mean, this is what, you know, you do in meta practice that you start with the benefactor and then the self and then a dear friend and a neutral person. Then you go to that difficult person, right? And um, so, I mean, it's implicit. That's what I mean. It's implicit. But to say to queer it, queering really reminds you that we're reading across categories. We're, the, 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 those containers are released. Mm. That when, when we're talking about interbeing, we really mean it. Yeah. Yeah. Not just we. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really glad you're saying that because I think that this is such an important important moment for that and especially i mean it always is of course but <laughs> but there's a lot going on right now in terms of like this good and e- i mean on both sides you know good and evil like those people over there who who supported this person those people are evil and they are it's impossible to include them in the we and like they might as well just be defeated you know so there's this you know kind of warmongering almost that's you know that's happening you know almost to the point of like feels like we might have a civil war on our hands in a few years if nothing changes and so you know how to based on what you're talking about how might that inform our sense of we versus them in the context of very real and very current kinds of political divisions Mm how to bring the Dharma into politics. (laughs) (laughs) Because when you say that, of course, you know, I I think most people here think of the Tao, that there's the dark and the light, there's the light and the dark. And that if we think uh, those those people should be annihilated, look look at them in us. Now that's what, isn't that what they're thinking? I mean, so here it is that the, the problem isn't, only external the problem is here so you know i, I don't have all the political answers jacob <laughs> but why I, not no. <laughs> <laughs> but some awareness will do yeah will go a long way yeah yeah for sure wow well greta this has been such a wonderful conversation really so much and inspiring things to consider and to contemplate. Is there anything that you'd like to leave off on based on what we've talked about? Is there any kind of words of wisdom or some insights that you'd like to share as we kind of end the conversation tonight? Um, The idea of human selfhood. uh, We just haven't unpacked it enough because, because humans are defined who's the real human ends up being white who's subhuman, who's the real human ends up being male, who's the real human ends up being not an other species, not plant. And so as long as our talk remains with human rights, we're not being inclusive enough. Yeah. Mic drop. (laughs) 
Greta, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you. Um, and ev thanks to everyone who has shown up tonight and, uh, and asked some questions and or just um, t took in the conversation. Uh, again, we will be releasing this as a podcast episode on the Chit Heads podcast. So you can give it a listen ag again. Or you can share with your friends if you'd like to. And, uh, and we, again, really appreciate your support by showing up. And thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Greta. Have a wonderful night. You too.